So like I said, you know, today we have a lot to cover. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Uh, but for everybody that is joining in now uh, here live, welcome. And uh, yeah, hopefully those of you that are walking home or out and about are enjoying your, your evening. And as we get kind of going into today's Conchas y Café session, uh, I want to first say thank you to those of you that are uh, registered on Google Classroom and who are who are also uh, actively sending in your work. Um, so, you know, thank you for, for sending in work to have it reviewed. Uh, the review process, you know, the workshopping that we're doing every other week is something that we are really trying to, you know, obviously take advantage of. And, um, you know, that's the sort of the main purpose of, of the off weeks. But this week is specifically a lesson. And we've got a lot of people obviously joining in here uh, in person for anybody that is watching the live stream, either on YouTube, on our uh, Twitter, or on our Facebook channel, you know, welcome to those that are watching on the live stream. Uh, for anybody that wants to actually submit work to be potentially published in this upcoming issue, just make sure you visit our website. It's pretty straightforward. Luis, uh, sorry, not Luis. It's D-S-T-L-A-R-T-S dot O-R-G. Um, thank you for, for commenting on my haircut there. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, you know, the, the uh, you know, ability for you to submit now is a possibility. So anybody that is already creating writing that is focused on censors or censorship, uh, you're more than welcome to start submitting your work now. The final day to submit writing for consideration in this upcoming issue of Conchas y Café Zine is February, uh, April 4th. So that is kind of, it's going to come up a lot faster than you think. So make sure you're getting that work done. And there's the website there. Thank you, Abraham, for posting that uh, to the chat and for our folks watching on the live stream. Let me go ahead and put it in there. And I'll even add on the Concha Si Café zine. So that way you get the direct link. All right. So like I said earlier, we've got a lot going on today uh, in terms of what we're going to be reviewing. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Este, lo siento para ustedes que prefieren leer en español uh, hoy. Para empezar, no tengo esto ya traducido, pero uh, sin embargo, podemos... Este, Podemos revisar o repasar este artículo que viene de Los Angeles Times. And for those that are registered and are receiving the, the handouts through Google Classroom, you should have gotten a PDF version of this. We won't read the whole thing because it is a little bit on the longer side. And there is one specific section that I felt really speaks to what we've been discussing in terms of you know, blacklisting, you know, and, and holding people kind of back from expressing themselves. So to summarize this first part here, just very quickly, uh, for those who are kind of, you know, up with current news, uh, you might not be surprised to know that there are a lot of uh, areas in the country where uh, people who are of more of a conservative uh, political leaning, they are fighting against the open use of books that have specifically uh, racial themes, as you can see here, and LGBTQ themes. Este, básicamente, esto es, es como un tipo de censura que está pasando actualmente en lugares en el país a donde típicamente la gente es más conservador. So, um, you know, some of the some of the interviews that are that are actually uh, quoted here, they speak a little bit more about how that's affecting the librarians at school libraries and also public libraries. Um, but, you know, for the purpose of today, we're going to specifically start right here. And I'll go ahead and read it for us. I want everyone to just listen to what, what is being uh, discussed here and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more after we finish. So, 
A number of school board meetings in recent years have become explosive and emblematic of the country's political animosities. Parents yell, boo, shake fists, and hold up sexually graphic images in dramas that play out on social media. Similar scenes have erupted at public libraries, including at the Patmos Library in Western Michigan, where at least two librarians have quit amid pressure and harassment from residents demanding the removal of LGBTQ books and young adult graphic novels. At the library's December board meeting, librarian Jean Riker denounced critics a week after the building closed early over fears for the staff's safety. She said that signs around town labeled her a pedophile and that she'd received abusive phone calls and had iPhones pointed at her. Her emotional retort came a month after a campaign led by conservatives succeeded in defunding the library, forcing it to rely on donations. Quote, we have been threatened, we have been cursed, said Riker. How dare you people? You don't know me. You don't know anything about me. You have said I've sexualized your children. I'm grooming your children. She raised her hands, her anger welled. I have six grandkids out there, she said, ticking off the offenses aimed at her. I moved to this town two and a half years ago, and I regret it every day for the last year. This has been horrible, she continued. I wasn't raised this way. I believe in God. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Christian. I'm everything you are. School and library boards are encountering demands from conservative lawmakers and parental groups, such as Moms for Liberty and Mama Bears Rising. And in a few instances, the far-right extremist group, the Proud Boys, to scrub libraries of what they consider upsetting pornographic and LGBTQ depictions. Many conservatives criticize schools as overrun with progressive ideas that are confusing children about race and gender. Quote, by exposing our children to adult concepts such as gender identity, we are asking them to carry a load that is much too heavy for them, Kit Hart, a Moms for Liberty, Liberty member said in a video posted last year from a school board meeting in Carroll County, Maryland. A 10-year-old should not be reduced to his sexuality. A video posted on the Moms for Liberty website shows another one of its members outlining her concerns at a public meeting in Mecklenburg, North Carolina. Parents beware of terms like social justice, diversity, equity, inclusion. Those inherently good things are being used to disguise a biased political agenda, she said. Our schools are becoming indoctrination camps and a breeding ground for hatred and division. Florida and other states have placed tougher restrictions on books that schools can stock. A Missouri law passed last year makes it a crime for a school to provide sexually explicit material to a student. After a discrimination complaint filed by the American Civil Liberties Union, the U.S. Education Department's Office for Civil Rights is investigating a Texas school district after a superintendent directed librarians to remove LGBTQ-related books. Quote, we have been thrown to the forefront of the cultural wars, whether we want to be there or not, said Amanda Jones, a middle school librarian in Livingston Parish, Louisiana who last year broke out in hives and fell into depression after she was threatened for speaking against censorship. It's not fun to be vilified in your small town or the country at large. It's all related to their using political fear and outrage, and they're using children to do it. Jones was skewered by conservative activists, including Citizens for a New Louisiana, after she warned at a library meeting that Quote, hate and fear disguised as moral outrage have no place in Livingston Parish. End quote. A picture of her appeared online with a red circle around her head, resembling a target, and she was called a pig and a supporter of teaching anal sex to 11-year-olds. Someone suggested she should be slapped. Martha Hickson, a high school librarian in Annandale, New Jersey, endured similar stress and said she lost 12 pounds in one week 
after she was accused by a parent at a school board meeting of being a groomer by providing graphic novels and memoirs such as Gender Queer by Maya Kobabe and Lawn Boy by Jonathan Evison that could steer children toward, quote, heinous acts. What really stung was that my name was used in that context, said Hickson, 63, who in 2020 received the American Association of School Librarians Intellectual Freedom Award. It was devastating. I broke down and I couldn't stop crying. She couldn't catch her breath, she said, and couldn't speak in full sentences. I cracked two teeth from grinding and was fitted with a night guard. I go to the pool now and swim three times a week. It washes the stress away. Jessica Brassington, head of the Texas-based Mama Bears Rising, which advocates for increased parental oversight in education, said her intent is not to rebuke librarians or teachers, but to get stricter state guidelines on selecting school books in what she sees as a broader war against her Christian faith. Quote, we want to protect our children. We've seen the dark side of what can happen beyond the book, suicide, alienation, said Brassington, whose organization has pressed for the removal of books in school districts and warned against children being indoctrinated by a, quote, evil sexual agenda. Quote, we want to know what books are available to our children. The parents are being bypassed. I'll stop it there. So it's kind of a heavy topic, but it is something that is actually happening now, right? There are people protesting at libraries and school libraries specifically, protesting that their children are being exposed to books that they feel they shouldn't be exposed to. Now, is that right or is that wrong? I guess it depends on who you are, but what are your thoughts? What are the things that come to your mind as you hear this article? Gia? Uh, yeah, it just, it, it broke my heart, especially because I think a library is such a sanctuary and a refuge for so many people as our books. And I actually read Gender um, Queer, the one, because it was like on every band list. Mm -hmm. And it's this wonderful book about this person's journey of discovering who she is. And it's funny and it's sad. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just so well done. And it just breaks my heart that, you know, this is what's happening. And just this weekend, I saw... Um, a video of somebody going through a school library in Florida and there was literally no books there because the librarians, the school librarians are so fearful about getting fined or being called out that it's like safer for them to have no books in the library. And, and again, I, I just, you know, all you can do is cry because all those little kids who you know, going to the library is like one of your favorite things to do in elementary school. You know, you're once a week getting to go and pick out all the books and everything. So, you know, it's and it's just scary because it is like they say most people don't want banned books. So it's this very small majority, but they have such a loud voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. It is a small uh, minority of, of people that are, you know, forcing these things to happen. Um, but, you know, that's, it is happening still. Well, um, Brother Lewis, yes, for me like to be honest without being a hypocrite, um, this is my belief, so take it or not. <laughs> um, there are certain great levels of material that should be uh, exposable or children should be exposable uh, according to where they are. Now, I think the birds and the bees, mm -hmm. so to speak, belongs to the parents. If the children are brave enough to ask them uh, about their, maybe they feel different or uh, whatever. Um, you know, like we have college books for the, those that are, have college classes, high school, 
you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, but my, my main scare of it, about this is that if they can get a, um, how do you say, a foot in the door with uh, getting rid of certain materials out of the library, mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking about them trying to erase history. I'm basically thinking about that. So yeah. once they get their, their foot in the door, then it's gonna, you know, it's like cutting off your nose to spite your face. So mm -hmm. there's a, a ultimate uh, purpose behind all of this. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, my son, I was talking to my son about it the other day. And he says, mom, he says that they don't want the younger generation coming up to see the hurt that they've done and hold themselves personally accountable. Because a lot of people, you know, youth, uh, I say youth, you know, uh, maybe 50 and uh, younger, they see the things that they have done. You know, they're trying to say it's still helicars. I think you said that last uh, week or so, or somebody I spoke to. Uh, so they're trying to erase history. How can you erase history? Mm -hmm. But I believe this is basically what the ultimate uh, mo motive is. And uh, the other thing, like I say, the birds and bees at a certain age should be discussed with the parents, you know, because I, I, I have uh, situations in my family and, uh, you know, that's family, mm -hmm. you accept or you don't accept, but, uh, you know, there, there's an age limit. Cause I know in, as a teacher, there are certain things that we couldn't discuss with the youth. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think that's fair. You know, I, I'm not discounting the fact that, you know, there are certain topics that maybe are more appropriate for a child to speak to their parent about. But that said, at the same time, you know, there are certain things that children are always going to be curious about and they're going to speak to whoever is available to them. Um, I know because yeah. with, with my little uh, brothers and sisters, my little siblings mm -hmm. and the, the little boy say, she don't have one ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, he want to know how come she didn't have one. So. Parents have to explain things, but you know, like you say, it could go a little deeper on a personal level, but I, I think yeah. it begins at home at a certain level. Yeah, to a certain level. Yeah, you know, um, and I see that you also, there's also uh, Diana who agrees in the chat, you know, that certain topics belong to certain age groups, which, you know, again, that's a, that is a fair argument. And when even publishers are crafting uh, you know, children's books and things like that, you know, they, they're very aware of the type of content that goes into an age appropriate book, you know, the type of language that's used and all of that. But that said, you know, can anyone argue that teaching, you know, tolerance and, you know, by celebrating diversity at a young age is wrong? Like we, I don't think that that's, that's necessarily wrong. And I don't think the majority of people believe that that's wrong either. You know, it's just going to, really depend, I think, largely on the way it's presented. Well, uh, the way, way, yeah, that's right. The way it's uh, ciphered out for that particular child uh, level. Yeah. You know, because they, they're quick to go home, mama, 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 daddy, daddy, or, or something, yeah, you yeah. know? And yeah. then there's a whole big mess. Right. Um, I saw that there was a hand raised from Maria and then Abraham and Neri. So, Maria? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh. Um, I kind of forgot my comment, <laughs> but uh, the main thing that uh, that I was going to share was that um, I have been working at in schools for the past like 10, 15 years. And apart from loving libraries myself, I have found that many students that are struggling with their identities often find uh, these kinds of books and literature to be like uh, comforting. Um, and so I think I worry about those uh, young people that are looking to literature for community. Um, and then I'll leave it. Thank you. I think that that's, that's a very, um, you know, very, very valid uh, observation as well. You know, like speaking for myself, you know, growing up with my parents always working, the place that I found refuge, refuge in was books you know, sea un libro para dibujar o un libro de, de poesía de niño infantil, you know, that was like the way that I coped being alone a lot. 
So, you know, it, books can can definitely be a refuge. Uh, Abraham and then Nettie. Well, just kind of an addition of what Eric is saying. To me, yeah, we need to have a consensus. Again, it's a consensus is like most of the people will vote in what is certain things that have age level will be considered right or wrong to teach. And also, are they doing this also to the sexual content or whatever they pursue for like uh, heterosexual people, right? Or are they just going for the books who are gay, right? Mm -hmm. Because if they're worrying about just sex, it's a different thing. But if you're just worrying about sex from other people, that's a different thing. And also it worries me a little bit the language they're using, you know, the, 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 the same language they use for all their stuff as well. So it's clearly a lot of political stuff. So I guess it has to be on the basis to basis book, not on the band on every book because they want to, right? Because they want to show that they can do it. And it's a slippery slope, like Luis is saying, like, what's next? We they already tried and have done it with history. Mm -hmm. So they will continue to do it. And there's a thing is you have to stop them and make sure that the things that they say they're going to do are the actual things, not because this is just an excuse to do things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, again, you know, that sort of echo from Abraham, right, about history, um, agreeing, I would say, with Ms. Lois and that, you know, there is a slippery slope and always the possibility that by censoring certain books or, you know, by censoring certain ideas, you're trying to essentially erase or rewrite history. And you know, the human race is bound to make those mistakes over and over again, so. And Luis, the worst thing is that they have shown, like history has shown us that when you ban something, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean people's not gonna see it. On the contrary, yeah. it's gonna be more attractive or people mm -hmm. who didn't find it in the library yeah. will find it somewhere else, which will not be the best place to have it on, right? Mm -hmm. And criminaliz criminalizing stuff, it's a problem. and. Mm -hmm. Do you know that they're trying to do the same thing all over and over? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, Nettie? Hey, well, sorry I don't turn on my camera, but I'm okay. wearing glamorous pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that just like any politically charged topic, most people are like gravitating to the extremes and finding very little common ground. But that's dangerous. No matter where your heart is, I think that's dangerous. We need to learn how to find common ground. And I can actually resonate at some point with both point of views. I feel bad for the people who are like caught in crossfire, crossing, caught in the middle of a fight or confrontation, because I know these things can get sometimes physical. And I feel very sorry for the librarians that they were cited in that article. But that being said, I mean, I mean, we need to learn where to draw the line. I'm against censoring, but I do think that there should be content that should be age appropriate, the same way we rate our movies and our music. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be treated that different. Um, for example, me as an adult, I enjoy and read and write heavy stuff, mm -hmm. but I can, I'm free to make that choice because I'm an adult. And sometimes when a book, feels so heavy I can always put the book away mm -hmm. and then I can later decide to go back to the book or never read it again but when when you're talking about kids in schools usually whether the book is age appropriate or not they happen to be in the curriculum so the kids somebody else is making that decision for the kid right mm -hmm. so the choice factor is important that's yeah. something to have to consider that doesn't mean I am up for censoring but also people have the right to choose what they read. And sometimes that element of choice is taken away mm -hmm. and depending on the context. So it's very much about their lines. We have to learn how to have the kind of age appropriate. We shouldn't erase history. We should talk about history and different levels. Explain for a five-year-old, explain to a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. We just need to find the right uh, context to do that and it's so difficult because especially that is um i mean especially that nowadays these topics are getting more politically charged yeah. it's very hard to get an unbiased uh unbiased version of the facts i don't know if that makes any sense mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, yeah, it, it definitely makes sense because kind of like I think what Abraham might have been also talking about a little bit is that you need to be able to see both sides and you need to be able to have a dialogue. Um, and I would definitely also add into that, you know, that it's it's really important for especially us as adults to understand that the way in which we treat children, you know, is going to reflect the things that we also want to have for ourselves, you know? So in my opinion, and this is only my opinion, I think that the people that are trying to ban books are really banning them out of a fear of something that they don't understand. Uh, and more often than not, that is what, what forms the, the basis of prejudice, of racism, of, you know, things that, that in a lot of ways, you know, are, are a detriment to our society. But, you know, that doesn't mean that I can't respect another person's ideas. You know, I can't respect another person's point of view. It just takes that sort of coaching, right? That sort of self-awareness for myself to know that, you know, I don't have to agree with you and you don't have to agree with me. All I have to do is respect you and your beliefs and hope that that is reciprocated back. So, um, let's see, I see a hand from uh, Roots and, uh, and then Miss Luz. So go ahead, Roots, whenever you're ready. Yes, I really appreciate the comment that uh, I think Nettie said about how um, we have to come to a common ground because I feel like like that's exactly the, the, the whole point. Um, because if you go even further in history, I mean, who is like, who's been burning books and, you know, taking our knowledge and hiding it from us. Mm -hmm. So I think like, I think it's the same hand in the background moving these this stuff around so that we can fight against each other because like causing this division you know um because i don't think that they necessarily tell us the truth about history as is like who's writing these history books right now you know but i do um i'm glad that parents are becoming more conscious of what their children are reading and like actually you know looking into it um i think that's that's my comment. Yeah, you know, obviously the more parent involvement you have in the raising of children, the better. Um, I think my only counter argument to that would be, you know, to what degree are you allowed to parent? You know, you can parent your own child for sure, but does that give you a right to parent someone else's and to restrict what another, another child learns or is exposed to? So, you know, we got we to gotta be open to these things. These, these ideas. Uh, Ms. Luce? Well, this conversation uh, brings me to um, an experience I had being a school nurse. Um, for the fifth graders, I had to present the growth and development talk mm -hmm. to all of the fifth graders. And um, I um, anticipated there would be questions. So I gave each teacher um, index cards for children to write a question and I would of course screen them and then answer the ones I felt were appropriate. And I was very amazed by the range of ignorance to knowledge. Uh, some kids were very savvy and knew, knew, knew already what the heck was going on and wanted to know, let's say about eight. <laughs> and then there were kids that were just like in La La Land. I mean, literally just knew nothing and wanted to know everything. Right. So I think Placing the information, uh, I mean, I feel like there's already a system in place, just like there is for for movies, uh, rated G, rated PG. You know, we we already have that system in place, and then it's up to the parent to to supervise how how strict they want to be. You know, when do they want their kid to grow up? But I don't think I think some of these parents just want their kids to be in in fantasy land. You know, uh, believing in Santa Claus and and not knowing anything, and then the child ends up hungry for information yeah. because they know the other kids already know about it, but they don't. And uh, I feel that it was very sad for those children because uh, they're in the dark, and at some point they they have to learn about it. But their parents don't want them to grow up, or they want them to to believe in uh, in I don't know in 
I feel like in, in I think there's a word like keeping them infantile um, mm. or just don't want them to grow up too soon. Mm. And uh, I can understand that too, but uh, I still, I feel like there's always gatekeepers out there mm. and that some of these people don't trust the gatekeepers. So I always felt like the librarians were very responsible in, in, in gatekeeping. So uh, why now, why do they want to take that over? Mm. I, I don't understand. Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, something that popped into my head as you were speaking, Ms. Luce, was what you said about the gatekeeper and how, you know, to be a librarian, at least in a public library and academic libraries, people need to have a master's degree. Um, That's not necessarily the case in a school library. In a school library, you can have a teaching credential, but that's still a very advanced level of education. Um, so they're not normally people who who are uneducated and they're going to pick up anything. You know, you, these you would assume are people that are that are uh, very well versed in a lot of different things. So, you know, it's if you're going to trust someone, definitely trust a librarian. That's just my two cents. <laughs> well, especially if you're not going to do the parenting yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because the fact of the matter is that you know not all not all kids all have that that privilege you know, of having both parents in the home who are able to dedicate time to both, you know, to, to the kid equally. So that's also a reality that we have to face. So it's a very heavy topic, um, you know, and thank you everyone for, for your comments because I think that it, it does help the conversation here. But um, to bring us back to our, our uh, lesson and before we do move on, I want to just simply uh, acknowledge, you know, this again, article, it comes from the Los Angeles Times. It was actually a recent article that came out in January. So as you can see here, it was written by Jeffrey Fleischman, a staff writer for the LA Times, and it was published uh, a couple of weeks ago on January 27th. So this is a, a relatively new article. You should still be able to find it if you want to read the whole thing on the LA Times website, or you can also uh, check out the PDF that I uploaded to our Google Classroom. Uh, pero para seguirle, este, I also uploaded to our Google Classroom a clip from this website here. Uh, this is from the Hirschhorn Museum. And uh, as I was you know, thinking about what I wanted to teach this week, I was thinking a lot about just the way in which censorship can manifest itself. And the ways in which it has, you know, a lot, a lot of times uh, actually been a detriment to, to society. Um, but kind of the flip side of that, I wanna say, is that some things, some ideas can be very problematic and sort of toe the line between what is maybe acceptable and what is not acceptable in terms of, you know, a society that celebrates diversity, that celebrates tolerance, that celebrates, you know, a, a, a plurality of ideologies. So um, specifically, we're looking at this, this uh, series of black rectangles that you see on this photo. Um, this is a piece by Rainier Levanovo who is a Cuban artist. And these are part of a series called The Weight of History or, or El Peso de la Historia, Five Nights. So the five rectangles represent five different nights or different books. Uh, rather than reading this whole thing, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of how these pieces came to be. So there's a software that's called Ink. And that software was used by uh, Leva Novo to replicate the ink and the amount of ink that was used to print first editions of very specific books. The five books that are represented in these five uh, blocks of ink are the uh, work of Vladimir Lenin, Adolf Hitler, Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong, and Muammar al-Gaddafi. So those five texts, those five books that are represented in these five pieces of art 
uh, are all considered to be, you know, as it writes here, incendiary, right? They're very uh, problematic, to say the least. Um, and they're books that had a huge impact, especially on the 20th century. So there's a little video here. I'm going to turn on the, the captions um, so that everyone is able to, to follow along. Hopefully, you're able to see this full screen. Um, y aquí les va. Hola, mi nombre es Reiniel Leiva Novo. Soy un artista visual eh, que vive en Cuba. Me interesaba mucho calcular el peso de la información. Entonces, para esto, desarrollé un, un software se llama Inc. 1.0, el cual calcula precisamente el volumen, el área y el peso de la tinta en documentos manuscritos o impresos. El siglo XX, según los estudiosos, es el siglo más sangriento eh, de la historia. ¿no? Y por eso fui a cinco eh, volúmenes eh, que son el fundamento ideológico de cinco sistemas totalitarios en el mundo. Estos libros han arrastrado consigo a la humanidad a ciertos momentos y espacios bien busqué la, eh, las primeras ediciones de estos libros y los procesé con el software una forma de traducir el pensamiento y la ideología a un soporte físico plano blanco y negro por eso en cada uno de esos eh, rectángulos eh, de tinta está contenida eh, también toda esta historia All right, hopefully y'all were able to see the video in full screen. Um, so again, these five blocks, these five rectangles that you see pictured there, they are a reproduction in a sense of the five texts that really inspired uh, basically genocides, you know? Um, so that's sort of there to set up what we're going to cover. Um, let's see, do we have any questions so far? Yeah. I trust the math, but not the execution really gives us the weight of the ink. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, Gia writes, I did not know this artist. Thank you so much for introducing him. The work is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, there is in the handout that I, that I uh, shared with you all. There's a little bit more about the, the work um, and the artist himself. Uh, so this is cut and paste and also translated for you. Uh, para los que prefieren leer en español, aquí tienen este, traducido el, el este, ¿cómo se llama? Uh, el texto que se ve en la página web de el uh, Museo Hirshhorn. So, you know, if you want to read a little bit more about uh, Leva Novo, uh, you, can, you can read this from the handout. He's, like I said, is a, is a Cuban artist that's based in Havana, Cuba. But, <clears throat> you know, again, these, these uh, blocks of black ink, you know, they were on display at this museum. And this wouldn't be a creative writing class without some, some kind of poetry, without some kind of writing. So. I present to you Ode to Rainier Leva Novo, which was written by Ave Haynes, who was the 2022 Harold Taylor Prize winner uh, from the University of Delaware. So they're a student at the University of Delaware. I'm assuming still a student there, so I couldn't really find much information about the poet. Uh, nonetheless, there is a poet's note or an author's note here. So this comes from the poet explaining what inspired this poem. Uh, so this poem is inspired by Leva Novo and his piece, El Peso de la Historia, Five Nights, which displays five historical texts commenting on censorship in Cuba. And rather than me droning on, uh, who would like to read for us the poem of the day? Do I have any volunteers here? Who raised their hand first? Let's see. Uh, Miss Luz, would you like to read for us the one in Spanish? And Roots, could you read for us the one in English? Will that work? 
I, I hadn't raised my hand, but if there's oh. no one else interested, uh, I'll give it a shot. You left it on. Uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, no problem. Uh, so, um, yeah, I guess, Ms. Luz, why don't you read it for us in Spanish first? And then we'll hand it over to uh, another volunteer for the English. Okay. Oda a Reiner Leiva Novo. I find un librito rojo colgando, manchado en una pared de exhibición blanqueada, encima de una lápida titulada The Weight of History, Revoluciones Reales, sangrando por sus constantes constituciones. Like a crucified guava, Censurado con oin, covered, cubierta, like a robe, rodando in the smoke hand, tosiendo, like la mitad of a smoking soul, in the air, susurros frescamente, volteados van encreciendo, encreciendo. Read me, read me. I open it. Pánico. Palpitante y words sil silenciosas como un ático póstumo. Prematura prematuramente publicados. Congelándose para oxidarse en una celda. Inflamed organs y luchas e firmes por la libertad. Escenas incendiarias vistas sleepwalking por la noche. The paper in flames is the paper of papers. Leyendo de un rollo de papel. Brother whipped with a baseball bat. Ritmo partiendo, salpicando, salpicado en muros rodeantes. El espinazo de its tongue atachuelado en donde sea que lo dejaron. The only words are on tombstones. Las únicas palabras están en las lápidas. The only words are on tombstones. Las únicas palabras están en lápidas. The only words are. Lo cierro. The pages del librito rojo cuelgan, manchados en una pared de exhibición blanqueada. The eyes close and start. Super suave, persuasivamente dolorosa canción. De partes igual, the end. Y el inicio. Don't, do not worry. Por tus palabras, respiran, respiran, respiran. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Luz. Yeah, you're welcome. I got caught up on some of those words. <laughs> it's okay. As, as you saw, you know, this was actually uh, originally a bilingual poem. So, you know, the uh, translation obviously also had to be bilingual. Uh, awesome. Good luck yeah. to the next person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the next person is Roots. Thank you for volunteering, Roots, whenever you are ready. Ode to Reina Le Leiva Novo. Yo encuentro a little red book hanging, stained on a bleached exhibit wall above a tombstone entitled El Peso de la Historia. Real revolutions bleeding through its constant constitution. Como una guayaba crucificada, censored with soot. Cubierta, covered, como una vata, covering in la mano de humo, coughing, como half de una alma fumando en el aire, crisply turned whispers, crisp. Crescendo, 
me lean, me lean, lo abro, palpitating panic and palabras as silent as the post humus, my bad, sorry, <laughs> attic published prematurely, freezing to rust in a cell, organos inflamados and fleeting freedom, fights, incendiary scenes seen sonambulan sonambulando through the night. El papel en llamas es el papel de papel. Read from a roll of paper. Hermano, batido con un be baseball bat. Split rhyme splattering on enclosing walls of spine of su lengua. Tackled to wherever they left it. Las únicas palabras están en las lápidas. The only words are on tombstones. Las únicas palabras están en las lápidas. The only words are on tombstones. Las únicas palabras está, I close it. Las hojas of the little red book hanging. Stained on a bleached exhibit wall. Cierran los ojos y comienzan. They persuasively painful canción. Equal parts, el fin and the beginning. No te preocupes for your words. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Excellent. Thank you, Roots. All right. So I see we got a couple of things here in the chat. Let me see. It was a tricky piece. Yeah, it was kind of a tricky piece. Can I ask um, a question? Yes. Go ahead, Ms. Lois. Now, you know, yo no hablo español, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> but it sounds like, uh, Everything is so heavy, mm -hmm. but it's being read. But, but, but I mean, you have to explain everything to me. But when it comes to the tombstone part, was his life so small and unimportant that his whole life is just those little words that's on the tombstone and that he was um, incarcerated or how do you say, cut off from life at an early age? That's an interesting interpretation, for sure. I mean, if that's what you're getting from it, then, you know, that's that's a very... Yeah, because valid. it was going in and out for me in my uh, little Spanish understanding. Yo yeah, for, español porquito. Yeah. Um, well, for that reason, I did, I did translate the uh, Spanish parts and the English, the original, actually, I should say. So the original is on this side. And it is originally called Ode to Rainier Leva Noble. Um, so I translated it to Spanish. And because this poem is a bilingual poem, as is obviously seen here, uh, I translated the Spanish parts in the original to English in yeah, the right. Spanish translation. Uh, so yeah. that could potentially help if you want to, you know, compare it. Uh, but that's no, like I can't. I mean. Just a few words from each side jumps out at me from my, you know, Spanish study. So, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, right. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, it's you know, I think that if you're still able to get that emotion though that you got, right? You you expressed that this was a heavy poem that you know the in, invoking of a tombstone and of a heavy heart uh, that comes across, and I think that that is a very very valid way of interpreting this this poem um, because the poem itself is responding to the act of censorship right it's in response to another artist's work of art this is actually something that we call ekphrasis and we've we've talked about this before in some of our past classes i just wrote it in the chat for those that that want to know how to spell it um, but ekphrasis is 
generally speaking, the and this is kind of like a very very quick way of of defining it. It's basically when an artist writes a work of art or creates a work of art in response to another work of art. Um, so this is this is responding to something that has a lot of layers to it already. Uh, I see a hand from Abraham. Yeah, sorry, I had to look for the buttons. Uh, <clears throat> I really like the part that says palpitating panic and palabras as silent as a posthumous attic published prematurely, freezing to rust in a cell. That's pretty cool. It's kind of what we're talking about, like putting books away mm -hmm. without serving their purpose right now. Yeah. They're rusting away. Yeah. Um, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, this is, it has, yeah, the, the re repetition, right, of the tombstone, right? The only words are on tombstones. If I'm not mistaken, that's probably a metaphor for the little placards that are, that go up with the pieces of art on the wall. So it explains to you what is actually there. Um, What's resting in peace? Exactly. What's <laughs> yeah, resting in peace in that right. big block of ink painted on the wall? Uh, I see a hand from Nitty. Okay, this is Nitty. I like this idea of code switching it's mm -hmm. so well performed mm -hmm. and even the word choice it's easy to follow in both languages even if you only speak one of them so i think it's a very thoughtful poem i liked it yeah well por algo ganó, right? there's a reason why it's a it's yeah award-winning poem <laughs> uh for the sake of <laughs> nice big red heart there from carlos uh for the sake of uh, being able to hear it again, you know, uh, and, and I'd like you all to really think about some of the imagery that, that stands out in this, this poem. Uh, I'll read it to us one more time and then we'll, we'll move on to uh, a little bit more of a dissection of it. So, and I'll read it in the original for us today. Ode to Rainier Leva Noble by Ave Haynes. Yo encuentro. A little red book hanging, stained on a bleached exhibit wall, above a tombstone entitled El Peso de la Historia. Real revolutions bleeding through its constant constitutions, como una guayaba crucificada, censored with soot, cubierta, covered, como una bata, hovering in la mano de humo, coughing, como half de una alma fumando. In Laire, crisply turned, whispers crescendo, Melean, Melean, lo abro. Palpitating panic and palabras as silent as a posthumous attic, published prematurely, freezing to rust in a cell. Organos, inflamados, and fleeting freedom fights. Incendiary scenes seen sonambulando through the night. El papel en llamas es el papel de papel, read from a roll of paper. Hermano batido con un baseball bat, split rhythm splattered on enclosing walls. The spine of su lengua tacked to wherever they left it. Las únicas palabras están en las lápidas. The only words are on tombstones. Las únicas palabras están en las lápidas. The only words are on tombstones. Las únicas palabras está. I close it. Las hojas of the little red book hanging, stained on a bleached exhibit wall, cierran los ojos y comienzan their persuasively painful canción. Equal parts, el fin, and the beginning. No te preocupes. For your words, breathe, breathe, breathe. All right. So, see an applause there. Thank you. Um, do you guys remember what the uh, what the five books were that are actually on display here? 
uh, Mao Zedong, Mein Kampf. Those are the two I remember. Yeah, Mein Kampf from Adolf Hitler and uh, Mao Zedong's, uh, what's it called? The. Uh, it is called The Little Red Book, I think. Is it The Little Red Book? Yeah, I yeah. think. Well, I know that it is referred to as the Little Red Book. I can't remember the exact title of it, um, but you know, basically, it, it it is the the Little Red Book that explains Mao Zedong's um, uh, ideology for communism. And so, Castro. Uh, and Fidel Castro, his book that is represented in that work of art by uh, Leva Novo, um, his is called something like. Uh, uh, history will forgive me or something like that. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't but, recall. Yeah. Just, yeah. And there's also a book by Vladimir Lenin that's also represented in the work of art and also a book by Muammar al-Gaddafi, uh, the yeah. former dictator of uh, Syria. So, um, so what these all have in common, Vladimir Lenin, Adolf Hitler, Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong and uh, Muammar al-Gaddafi, you know, they all have in common the fact that they were dictators of their countries. Uh -huh. And they all have also in common that they are, because of their words, because of their books that they published, they are responsible for the mass murder and the genocide of large groups of people, of indigenous people to, to certain regions and to, you know, um, people of, of particular classes, social classes. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said about having one, the privilege to publish a book, you know, the privilege to write and publish a book. And two, the sort of hypocrisy of turning your, your uh, fascist ideology into an excuse for killing artists who might otherwise you know, speak out against your fascism. Um, yeah, writers are evil, lesson of the day. <laughs> Some writers can be. But let me ask you this though. You know, looking at, looking at this and understanding the context in which this poem was created, you know, you might be, be uh, you know, open to the idea that the tombstones that are referred to here Las únicas palabras están en las lápidas. The only words are on tombstones. You might take that as literal in that the tombstones themselves are the, the black works of art that are on the walls. And the only words are the description of what that ink rectangle is. But imagine the words that exist when a person dies. The words that exist to explain what their life was, what they meant to the world, right? They're left on tombstones for those who are buried and have a tombstone. You'll typically see a name, a date, and what they were to the person burying them, father, mother, son, daughter, etc. right? Those are the only words that are left at the end of a person's life. So these books, like Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler, you know, that book, that piece of writing, it resulted in mass killings. It resulted in the death of millions of people. And all that's left of those people now is the words on their tombstones. So if we kind of take a step back and think about the impact of words, the impact of censorship, you know, all of those dictatorships, they all have that in common. They all have the act of censorship as a major part of what made their dictatorship function. For those that don't remember history too well, you know, in Nazi Germany, they had mass book burnings. In Syria, when Muammar al-Gaddafi <clears throat> took control of the, the government of Syria, the same thing happened. A lot of books were burned. Look at even further back in history. What were the first things that were normally burned during the colonization period? 
there's a reason why very few original texts from our ancestors exist because they were all burned by the conquerors, right? Um, for fear of us learning, having knowledge. Right, for fear of us having knowledge. And thank you, Carlos, for sharing an image from the Getty uh, showing a Mayan book that was burned, uh, partially burned by the Spanish. And the I know, um, Brother uh, Lewis. Yes. My lady uh, friend, uh, she told me, uh, you know, she was from uh, Cuba. Mm -hmm. And she says that, um, what's his name? The first one, Castro. Fidel Castro. Uh -huh. Yeah, that uh, he was such a great speaker and influencer. Mm -hmm. Is that such a word? That they yeah. voted for him. But once they got in, he had soldiers going up and down the streets and uh, monitoring them, and they actually took their Bibles away. Mm -hmm. That was a book. Mm -hmm. And if anybody was caught praying, they was actually, uh, if not executed, they were thrown in jail. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow they had to leave to come out. And so she and her family made it out, but his fiance couldn't. And I think he had something in his wallet or something that caused them to incarcerate him. And she says every time she saw a, a commercial about come to Cuba, mm -hmm. I mean, it would get on her nerves. She said, it's not like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the thing that I think is really sad is that, you know, the ideas of communism, you know, the ideas of, of a populist nation, you know, they're not terrible necessarily. You know, we should all have equal access to food, water, shelter. We should all have equal access to healthcare, to an education, to, you know, a, a freedom of, of speech and religion, you know, like all of those things we, we should all have. And those are things that are popular ideas. They're populist in nature, right? Because it's about the people, the population. That's what makes it a populist idea. What, yeah, what, what, what pushes it into the, the world of fascism, though, is when you really start to take people's civil liberties away, right? When you start to take away people's ability to express themselves as they see fit, when you take away people's ability to practice the religion that they believe is, is right for them when you take away a person's ability to love the person that they really want to love and to be how they feel they were created. You know, those are, those are the things that push people into fascism. And it's a very fine line between conservative, social conservatism and fascism. You know, that's, that's really what we're looking at when we're looking at articles about book bannings. You know, it's right ideology versus practicality, right, versus a reality. An ideology is okay to have, right? We all have our own individual ideologies. The problem when, ha, the problems occur when one ideology butts up against another one and it becomes a law. And, you know, that's, that's where a lot of the things that are happening with politics and our culture, even here in the United States and beyond, you know, those are the things that are that are really starting to to damage our ability to coexist. So, you know, censorship is one of those first steps to you know fascism taking a hold, and we really need to consider that, right? Especially for those of us who who see ourselves as writers, as artists here today, whether you're watching on the live stream or you're here in the class now. You know, those are things that we have to be very much aware of. And, you know, it's, it's an added burden, maybe, you know, it's an additional thing that we have to think about as we're creating art for ourselves. But in the end, it's a, it's a reality that we all kind of need to accept. Because we as artists can speak to larger populations through our words, through our images. And we can be you know, clever and use metaphor. And we can use 
uh, things like tongue in cheek and satire, and we can use uh, even our own sort of self censorship in a way to to get ideas across that that need to be shared. So, with that in mind, we're gonna go back to our handout, and I have a few questions for you. The first question or the first little activity that I'd like you all to consider um, as we we begin the, the sort of practice section of our class here. I want you to imagine the physical weight of censored words, right? Leva Novo imagined the physical weight of these books, you know, using software, right? So in a literal sense, he created a, a thing that is tangible, that has weight, that can actually affect gravity, right? But now imagine taking away all of these words, all of these books that are being banned in school libraries and public libraries. Imagine the physical weight of those censored words, of those censored books. And I want you to describe how that weight affects physical spaces. Does it make time bend? Is the physical weight so heavy that it makes time bend and it creates a gravity well, just like a black hole? Is it you know, so heavy that it leaves an indentation on a sidewalk? Are the words that are censored so heavy that they can make a tree collapse, that they can roll down a hill and grow and grow and grow the way a snowball does? You can write your, your ideas, your thoughts in the chat, if you like, to share with the rest of the group or you can write them for yourself on a separate sheet of paper. So I'll give you two more minutes to write down your thoughts. An excellent quote in the chat there. Chia, thank you for sharing that. I think Roots has a question. Yes, Roots. Yes, I don't really understand what you mean by does it make time bend or does it create gravity well? Can you just like explain that a little bit better? Uh, well, that's just me being being kind of metaphorical in the sense of like, you know, uh, anything that has a physical weight can create uh ultimately like fluctuations in gravity um so that's me being more like scientific and you know it's it's not meant to be literal it's meant to just sort of get you thinking about in what ways would the physical weight of all of the censored words you know what what could that do to the environment to anything around you if you were to compare it to a, a physical object what would all of that censored, all of those censored words, you know, feel like. So we're using metaphor in this sense. I hope that helps. Before I move on, I'll give you all like one more minute to jot down your ideas. Just write the first thing that comes to mind. First couple of words, nothing's right or wrong. This is just to get you thinking. Okay. Excellent. All right, the next part, and I'll read it off in Spanish first this time. Imagina la oscuridad de un mundo sin libros. 
¿Cómo te afectarían las tinieblas de un mundo sin libros? ¿En dónde encontrarías la iluminación que actualmente nos traen los libros? Imagine the darkness of a world without books. How would the darkness of a bookless world impact you? Where would you find the illumination that books currently bring us? Again, using our imaginations here. Nice. Good job, Diana. Remember, there's no right or wrong way to answer these questions. <laughs> Ooh, like that line. Miss Michelle's got a fire line right there. Can we can we answer from our paper? Yeah, you're welcome to answer. We've got some people already adding theirs to their uh, to the chat. So when do we start? Go ahead, Miss Lois. I have a, I, it, mine is all crazy. Okay, so, so the first question is um, physical space. Uh, it's like becoming a um, missing link and um, the importance of what was said, what was said to be is no longer there. And then the other one is, um, does it make time in, does it create what says gravity wells? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's like uh, outer space with something that you can't. It's it's untangible. How do you say untangible? Yeah. Okay. And as far as I got on that one, and then the other one says, imagine the darkness of a world without books. And I have down here. Um, where is it at? Wait a minute, where is it at? Destroying what is or is not in reality. And then what was the last one? Um, how would the last, how would this thing, the, the questions keep jumping up on the, on the words somebody's writing. Go away, go away, okay. How would the darkness of a bookless world impact you and where would you find the illumination, the books certainly, let me see, that, that was, well, anyway, it's not there anymore. Um, where is it at? Make, make one question his or her What, I, I messed up, don't tell me, that's okay. Okay, I can't read my own writing, but it's okay. <laughs> no problem. It's okay. All right, so. I think, it's, right. I think it was supposed to say, um, make one question his or her, because uh, uh, I got them almost the same understanding what is or is not reality and one questions his or her i don't know forget it it's that's it all right well that sounds like you 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 got off to a pretty good start there miss lois you got off too but what happened at the finish line <laughs> <laughs> oh, the horse is in the starting gate yeah there you go and that's really what matters with this this particular exercise uh, because as you can see here, um, what I've highlighted on the screen and also am now putting in the chat is your uh, homework assignment, as we like to call it, for the week. Oh. Um, 
So using your answers to the previous questions, you know, some of the thoughts and ideas that popped in your head in answering the previous questions, I want you to write a poem that illustrates for your readers the weight of censorship, history, and knowledge in our current world full of fear. Because honestly, when it comes down to it, that's what it is. You know, this world is very full of fear. There are a lot of people in this world who are just simply afraid to exist in their own, uh, in the way that they, they want to, right? And, you know, they, they, because of that fear, are oftentimes, you know, alienating other people and making other people feel like they're not able to express themselves either. So it becomes this vicious cycle. Yeah, every time you want to say something, you know, there's a, a how do you say, a um, criticism, and you don't want to say anything anymore, especially in front of that person. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's always that fear of, um, you know, of saying the wrong thing, you know, and if you say it on, like, say, social media, you know, there's the fear of being canceled now, which at a, in, a, in a previous time in history might have been, you know, the same thing as being blacklisted. Uh, or being censored, you know. So this is nothing new. For anybody that is a student of history, you'll realize that, you know, these are things that, that continue to happen, yeah. have been happening for the longest time. Yeah, if so, anyone, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I, all I was going to add was, you know, so take that into account. You know, that's part of, part of the reason why in your homework assignment today, we're not just talking about the weight of censorship, um, but also the weight of history you know, as, as uh, Leva Novel also considered history because, you know, those books that he reproduced as black rectangles on a white wall, you know, those are, those are history, you know, to a certain degree. Um, so all of those things do, do have a weight on our world, right? They're, they're impacting our world today. Um, but you wanted to add something, Ms. Lewis, there? No, I was going to say, I don't know if anyone is old enough, except for me and Miss Luce, <laughs> that um, a long time ago, they used to have this, uh, this uh, show called the Smothers Brothers, and they made a comment, and they cut them off the air. Yeah. Yeah, but now they're saying, oh, oh man, what they're saying now is crazy. Yeah, it's, you know. It's, it's a different world, but the same world at the same time. You know, it's, uh, I mean, I, I like to use this phrase in a lot of our classes that we've taught before that use history. You know, it's continuity and change. You know, yeah. the more things change, the more they stay the same. That's, that's the phrase. But what was that other one called? Equal, but yet, let me see, equal, Equal but not equal or something. I don't know. It's, it has something to do with uh, the Jim Crow law a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. You mean separate but equal? Yeah. That I think yeah. that was it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, separate but equal was the concept that you could have segregation um, and, you know, things would be equal because of segregation. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. It wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, I see a hand raised from Nettie. There is a similar quote. Or maybe, well, I don't want to say similar because it can convey a different meaning now that I think of it. But in animal form, one of the books of Orwell, it says some animals are more equal than others. Mm -hmm. And he says that whenever the beaks take over control and replace humans in the storyline. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, there's been a lot of writers that have written in different ways about what we're talking about. Uh, Maria in the chat mentioned Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. You know, that's a book that's specifically about the burning of books. You know, firemen are not actually putting out fires, but creating fires and specifically burning books. Um, for, uh, sorry, uh, Animal Farm by Orwell, George Orwell. You know, that is about, you know, a, a populist uprising that turns into a fascist dictatorship. Um, so there's a lot of different ways in which artists have, have actually tackled some of these, these concepts. The book Thief, um, which is takes place during Nazi Germany, the book Thief. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, there's, yeah, there's a lot. Um, so, you know, again, we're not necessarily doing anything new with this exercise, but what we are doing is, you know, you're doing it through your words, through your voice, uh, which should never be silenced. And that is the main, main point here. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's your turn. It's your turn to speak to these things. Uh, Gia? Um, yes, sorry. I'm not sure if I missed it, but did you say you were going to put it in the chat? Because I didn't uh, take a screenshot of what were the specifics. And also, will you say again, I, I only wrote down part of it. What did you say? Um, continuity. What was that quote? I liked it. Uh, continuity. And change. Continuity and change. Yeah. Would okay. you elaborate on that, Luis? Can uh, you say it again so I can write it down? Yeah, so the concept of continuity and change is actually something that I learned when I was in middle school. Um, so shout out to Wahomey Park Academy. Uh, you know, it was uh, one of our expected school-wide learning results, one of our Esslers. And uh, the basic idea behind uh, continuity and change is, is, like I said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So continuity, there are certain constants in history, like war, colonization, uh, those kinds of things are actually generally constants, um, but there's always different group doing it. So there's always change happening. There's always one uprising after another, after another. Uh, so it's learning to see those patterns of continuity and change. You know, what are the things that always motivate these things? It's generally money, land, and whatever else is assigned a specific value that is, you know, a resource. So those are the, the continuities of history. And the change, again, just comes from, you know, who's doing the, uh, the plundering at the time. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, no problem. And uh, I put in the chat one more time the uh the writing prompt for this week in both english and spanish can this be downloaded on yeah yeah so this handout along with the article that we read uh from the la times both are right now available for you to download from google classroom so those of you that are registered through google classroom i highly recommend you read the full article from the la times number one and number two uh, I also, you know, suggest you uh, take a look at the website for the Hirschhorn Museum one more time if you want to look at the, the artwork that uh, inspired the poem that we read today. So, shout out to, the, uh, to our sources for today's lesson. Support your, your local museums and your local newspapers, y'all. Don't let these institutions lose their funding and go by the wayside. Freedom of expression, freedom of press, all that good stuff. So uh, yeah, with that said, uh, are there any final questions, last observations? Algún último comentario para la noche? Para ya terminar la noche? Oh. I, just a question. So next Tuesday is workshopping, right? Correct. So, okay. Yeah. So thank you for the reminder, Nettie. Um, for those of you that attended today and for anyone who watches this video afterwards, uh, and if you are also enrolled in the class through Google Classroom, you have already been assigned a cohort. If you haven't been assigned a cohort yet, I will make sure to update you on the status of who is in your cohort. Um, be sure to send your writing for their review by the end of the night, Friday night. So this upcoming Friday, make sure that you, you share it using Google Docs. Please update um, my list, Mr. Lewis. I shall. Brother Lewis. I shall, Miss Lewis. Good night, everybody. I'm I'm signing off. I gotta go. All right. Have a good one, Miss Lewis. All right. Thank you. Um, your hand from.
Abraham, she raised oh. your hand. <laughs> I didn't hear you. Um, as well as submitting your work on Friday, remember to check your uh, cohort's work, I mean, your team's work, and prepare for uh, Tuesday with already your stuff. Uh, so for Diana, let's see, there's a question. Can we reach out to each other if we have further questions regarding the topic? Yes, you're more than welcome to re reach out to uh, either me or Abraham. Um, our email addresses are pretty easy to remember. Uh, it's basically our first names at dstlarts.org. I just put it in the chat for those of you. Uh, who might need them again. Um, if you want to talk to other people in the class, you're more than welcome to post questions or comments also in uh, Google Classroom. Uh, so that way other people can see the question and also uh, your ideas and you guys can bounce ideas off of each other that way. Um, that's a, another good opportunity to take advantage of the community throughout the week. And see, there was also another comment a uh, poetry related comment like hi thanks yes um just in case anybody is interested on thursday evening which is actually two days from now there will be a poetry reading in long beach um maybe i can share the details via email but it'll be in long beach at 7 p.m at page against the machine and it's a bookstore in Long Beach. They sell a lot of cool literature that actually might be related to the class. So oh, yeah. I'll be sure to check it out and see if there's anything we can um, connect with. Um, but that's it. Um, and I really enjoyed the class today. Thank you. Sweet. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely check out, uh, you know, the, the events that are coming up. Um, Page Against the Machine is definitely a cool place. Uh, again, you know, support your local bookstores. Um, the, the good ones. And uh, to add to that, I also want to invite everyone to join us this upcoming Sunday for a workshop that one of our mentees is hosting. Uh, Mauricio Moreno is going to be actually leading a walking tour of South Central, a very short one. So, you know, don't don't expect to like go on a hike. Uh, but this little brief tour is going to be uh, covering the concept of racial covenants and how redlining impacted the neighborhoods of South Central. Uh, so if you go to uh, distillarts.eventbrite.com, you can actually register now uh, for that particular workshop session. It'll be Sunday, this upcoming Sunday, February 12th at 1230 p.m. We will be meeting at the parking lot of DD's Discount. So all those details are available to you when you register on Eventbrite, so yeah. I'll also add that link to our Google Classroom too. So anybody that's interested, y'all have the opportunity to register there as well. And yes, he has been working very hard on this lecture. So come out and support Mauricio. All right, so any final questions, final comments? No. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us, for everybody watching afterwards uh, on YouTube. Thank you for sitting through another session. Uh, you know, and we look forward to catching your work when the deadline approaches. So take care, everybody. Have a good night. Good, good night. Thank you. Good night. All right. Hasta la vista. Baby. <laughs> Buenas noches, everybody. Buenas, Buenas noches. Bye, guys. Bye.